Thanks, Paisley. Good morning. Welcome to Nauvoo Methodist Church. Y'all doing good today? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, it's good to see everybody this morning. I have a couple of announcements that we need to make sure everybody understands. Tomorrow evening at 630, the leadership team will meet downstairs. If you're on the leadership team, or you have a concern or something you'd like to bring up to the leadership team, be here at 6.30 tomorrow evening. After service today, we are having a soup and sandwich lunch. And everybody is invited. I don't care. I've already had people tell me, well, I didn't bring anything. Well, okay. You can bring next time. But you can come today. Everybody's welcome to stay today, there'll be plenty of food. We're going to go downstairs immediately following worship and have fellowship together and have lunch together. So come on down. Um, where's our yogi? Yoga tonight? Okay. So after we have soup and sandwiches, we can come and work that off tonight. Yoga at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. All right. Everything else is on here. Um, I do have a couple other things. First of all, there are some brochures. Oh, there aren't brochures. We only got two. We're going to get some more, though. I'm just, I'm going to tell you, um, well, the leadership team hasn't talked about this yet, but I'm going to go ahead and say that we need to vote no on issue one that's coming up in November. There's information on here. I'm not going to go through all this, but we will get some information to you but please be looking for that. That's all right. Also, on the 29th of this month, that's three weeks from today, we're going to have a, a fellow by the name of David Timms. It's our fifth Sunday song service. And instead of getting folks from inside the congregation or whatever, this guy is a professional country gospel singer. He's with New, New South Artists out of Nashville, Tennessee. And he's, gonna, he's from the state of Mississippi himself. He's going to be here during our worship service and is going to sing, do a concert for us that morning. There will be a love offering received for him. So please, please be prepared for that. Um, he was in Waverly yesterday. Um, they had a festival up there in their park and he was part of the entertainment we didn't get a chance to go but he's going to be at Old Town and Nauvoo on the 29th of October we'll get posters up and if you'd like to take a poster someplace and hang it up that would be marvelous we have some on the back table all right other announcements are you doing your thing now oh 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 okay Paul, you can turn the monitors down on the thing a little bit, please. I know. Okay. I know many of you um, know all about Operation Christmas Child and have helped for years. But we forget that we've got some new people among us that have, haven't a clue. Um, Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes are filled with school supplies, uh, toys, games, balls, shoes, or flip-flops, and sent around the world to share the love of Jesus Christ. The boxes go mainly to third world countries or impoverished people groups. Many, many of the children who get these shoeboxes have never gotten a gift of any kind, ever. And many of them... Um, will probably never get another gift like that. 
And unlike the U.S., many countries do not allow children to attend school without school supplies or shoes. And being that these boxes are going to the low-income people, a lot of them can't afford school supplies for their children. The boxes that we pack, we aim to put in sandals, flip-flops, or shoes in every box, along with school supplies and toys. For our packing party, we still need pencils and pencil sharpeners, scissors, glue sticks, and colored pencils. Um, I have created an easy way for you to help. There is a page on the back table there. Um, if you just want to buy these independently, that's fine. But there's also um, a link on our Facebook page and on our web page that goes right to an Amazon wish list. Some of those, um, de I guess it's dealers, yeah, um, offer free postage. Some of them don't. Um, if you want to donate money to purchase something, I do have an Amazon Prime account, and I can get free shipping on any of that stuff. Um, we also have cardboard boxes as you go out the door if you want to pack your own shoe box. There's also a couple of plastic ones on the front row of that back section. Um, those shoe boxes are super strong. They were made specifically for uh, Samaritan's Purse. And when I was at a training event, a full box, there was a full box, and a gentleman that weighed 180 pounds stood on that box, and it did not break. And many of those Sterilite boxes that you can buy for a dollar, um, a lot of those don't even make it to North Carolina. When I worked at the processing center, I was stunned how many of those broke. Um, anyway, um, I also need some helpers to bag soap. We have boxes of soap back there, and you just take a washcloth and like trifold it and wrap it around a bar of soap and stick it in a fold over plastic bag. Um, we have containers to put those in once you get done as well. So I will be in the back after the service. Um, and I also have whistles that need instructions put with them in a Ziploc bag. Because you can put water in the whistle and make it like tweedle up and down. <laughs> so thank you very much. Okay. Other announcements? Let's all stand before the Lord. Oh, Jamie has an announcement. Go ahead, Jamie. Stand up. Four o'clock. The men's Emmaus Walk closing is today. Those of you who would like to attend that starts at four o'clock at Cornerstone Church in Ashland. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. All right, now you can stand up. The Lord who made you and helped you says, Do not be afraid, O Jacob, my servant. O dear Israel, my chosen one, for I will pour out water to quench your thirst and to irrigate your parched fields. I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your children. They will thrive like watered grass, like willows on a riverbank. Some will proudly claim, I belong to the Lord. Others will say, I am a descendant of Jacob. And some will write the Lord's name on their hands and will take the name of Israel as their own. We serve a great God, don't we? Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to sing. I hope you came ready to sing today. I guess Donnie and I talked about this. We have done this, but it's been a while. Aren't you glad to be a Christian this morning? Well, this song says, ain't it grand to be a Christian? And we, we apologize to any English majors. Ain't it grand to be a Christian? Ain't it grand?
Saturday, Sunday. Ain't it grand to be a Christian? Ain't it grand? All right, now you you're just learning. I get it, but we're gonna we're gonna do that first verse again. You ready? And if you wanna clap or stomp your feet or whatever, this is a good one to do that on. All right, here we go. Ain't it grand to be a Christian? Ain't it grand? seated. All right. Uh Uh-oh. We'll invite the children to come forward. You can give it to me. I'm a trashy guy. Um, Well, good morning. How y'all doing? Good. Good. I'm glad. Um, We talk about this every year around this time, but I'm going to talk about it again because today is the beginning of of National Fire Prevention Week. What is that? That's a really good question. It's a time when we remember and we we kind of go over again in our heads and talk about it, about how we can prevent fires. Because fires are dangerous, aren't they? Unless they're really handled properly, fires can be dangerous. People can get hurt. I'm sorry, what did you say? It's, well, yeah, all October, but this week is, this is a specific week from today to next Sunday. It's Fire Prevention Week. So we're going to do our best. Now, now, the first thing is we don't play with fire, do we? Hello? We don't play with fire because we can get hurt or somebody else can get hurt or we can see property damage, things can get destroyed. We don't play with, so we don't play with lighters. We don't play with matches. What else don't we play with? Help me. What, what, what? Stove, we don't play with the stove. That's right. Or candles. All those things. So we, we, we don't play with anything that has anything to do with it's not a toy, right? So we stay away from those. What happens, what do we do if the house catches fire? What? Get out and then call 911. But you get out first. You don't stop on the way. Well, I think I'll call 911. What's the number to 911? Do you remember? Oh, 911 is the number. I never can find an 11. I, I, I dial the nine, but I can't find the no. It's nine one one, right? Right, nine one one. Yeah. So we get out of the house, we get out of the building, whatever it is. We get outside, we get to a safe place, and then we call nine one one, right? And who takes care of the fire? Firemen, firefighters, firefighters. 
We have some of those here today. Did you know that? That, Yeah, right down there is the firehouse, but we have some firefighters here this morning. Why don't you, won't you stand up? Won't y'all stand up? I want you to see these people. I have to look at them all the time. (laughs) Turn around, turn around and look. Um, How about Brock Entler over there? Brock's going to stand up just like the rest of them. Brock's a firefighter. Uh, How about, how about uh, Danny Artis over there? Danny's a firefighter. And Scotty Byer, he's a firefighter. And way in the back, see the guys back there in the in the booth, Don, Donnie Richards and Paul Conley, they're firefighters. Yeah, did I miss anybody? I'm scared. Oh, that would be me. I really am. I'm the one that tears up trucks. And I do it well. Yeah. So let's thank these guys. And next Sunday, okay, you can sit down now. Thanks, guys. I know we're not having a a, a day dedicated to first responders, but I wanted to get you guys recognized. Um, next Sunday's a parade, the fire prevention parade. So I hope you all will be there for that. And uh, go down and check out the firehouse. And I think they're giving out hot dogs. Paul says, yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So first six people get a hot dog. You got to be fast. You got to be fast. All right. All right. So we don't play with fire and we call 911, right? Outside the building. Okay. Got it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for uh, those who serve our community and protect protect us and help us to be safe. And I pray for all these children and their families that you will also keep them safe. Help them not to play with fire, but to to know how to use it wisely and uh, so that no one gets hurt. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, let's see. I don't know if we got, Trish, you want to handle this for me? Thanks. Appreciate you. No birthdays. Are we missing somebody? Anybody having a birthday this week? It's getting low. You know, we got light the night coming up at the end of the month. Brother Mike. Brother Mike's in charge. 31st. Yes, 5 to 7. And if you would like to participate would you let him know okay he's going to have a sign up sheet for next week and he will make sure that you are taken care of but we're going to have a big turnout we're going to do hot dogs this year is it 12 that day paul 18 on the on for halloween so the first 18 people get hot dogs uh all right So we're looking forward to that. How about anniversary? No anniversaries either. All right. Well, who drew the straw today? That would be Allison with such enthusiasm. Y'all go with Miss Allison downstairs. Be nice to her. Ushers, we will now worship the Lord by the giving of his tithes and our offerings.
We have given these tithes and offerings, Lord, because we love you. And we're grateful to be here today and thankful that we can participate in the work that you're doing, both in this community and all around the world. Bless the gift and the giver. Bless those who cannot give. Lord, watch over us and use us for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Go ahead. I'm using this mic again. <laughs> Every year when we have hacked shoe boxes, we have included information of our church. And I've got the picture of um, when we had our 90th anniversary celebration. I need a 100th anniversary picture, don't I, for this year? Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> I want to share a conversation that took place over about two months' time from Madagascar. Someone had um, contacted us through our church Facebook page. And I'm not sure of the pronunciation, but I'm going to create something. It just said, Nai Avo, and it said, Bless the Lord. That was it. Nothing else. <laughs> and I responded, Hello, where are you writing us from, Nai Avo? We are in West Portsmouth, Ohio, USA. It was a week later that I heard, I'm in Madagascar and live in Ansarabi. So I Googled a map and I chopped off kind of part of Africa so you could see um, Madagascar is represented here as a green island on the right hand side of the screen on the southeast side of Africa. And Ansarabi is right there near the center of the country near the point of the large arrow it is at an elevation of 4,921 feet. Their temperatures range from 90 degrees in the summer to normal lows of 54 degrees in the winter, though occasionally it does get down into the 30s. Since they are south of the equator, their seasons are reversed from ours. They are coming into their spring at this time. We'll go to the next slide. I asked, did you or a family member receive a shoebox from our church? They were delivered by Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child. And four days later, I got an answer. Yes, we did. We are the Rock of Christ Church. We have received the gifts you have sent. Thank you so very much for your willing to help us. May God bless you all. And I responded, thank you for contacting us. Do you have any pictures of the children receiving their shoeboxes? Yes, I do. These are the pictures of sharing the gifts. In this picture, it's, it's a little blurry. They have very low pixel count, so it doesn't enlarge well. But there are children sitting on a tarp beside a pile of shoeboxes. Our shoeboxes that we packed, that we traded that we packed into Livingston's town truck, the shoe boxes we packed. <clears throat> Go to the next slide. Months after you packed the shoe boxes, halfway around the world, children were receiving gifts representing the love of Christ and the free gift of eternal life. So I ask, wonderful, will you be teaching the children the greatest journey? Yes, there is a teacher who is a responsible of teaching the children here. These are the pictures preaching the gospel to the children. That's a little dark, but the children, they are in a part of the village of Ansarabi that has no church. And they are teaching in the shadow of a building with the children sitting on the ground. In the lower right hand corner where the aerial is a girl it's kind of, it's hard to see but there's a girl holding a copy of the greatest journey bible study just it's that 12-week program 
that children can attend after they've gotten their shoe boxes. And you can just barely see there on the right-hand side, the boy is here holding a book. It's blue and green with some white writing. That's the Greatest Journey Bible Study Book. Next slide. I was surprised to be told that this is a picture of the person I had been communicating with over the previous weeks, Nai Avo. He is the young man, 19 years old, and he is teaching the greatest journey. And his father is a pastor in, in Ansarabi. The next message I got came from his father, Pastor Joseph. We started a new church here in Ansarabi, so we ask you for your prayers for us because we still don't have a church building to worship God. Thank you beforehand. Did I get out of order? Are you doing all right? I don't, anyway. No. So if we go back to the first picture, on the far left, you can actually see Father Joseph, or Pastor Joseph, <laughs> reflecting on what he shared, we have created a problem, a wonderful problem of having people who want to worship God with no building to gather in. Praise the Lord! <laughs> Praise the Lord! Your gifts, your purchased items or finances, the giving of your time, the packing of your shoe boxes, is furthering the kingdom of God. Keep up the good work. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we pause right now. We want to, first of all, praise you for who you are. Thank you for all you do. God, it is so good to be in your presence in this place, to come together to, to express our love for you, our worship for you. Um, we couldn't make it in this world without you, Lord. It's, it's a hard place. It's harsh living in this world. And the evil one is so present and so vile and so active. And um, we struggle. So we pray today, Lord, that uh, you will raise up your church. You will lift us up above all the things that tend to drag us down to help us to be overcomers in our faith and to stay, stand firm in who we are in Christ. We pray for all these prayer concerns, for all the people who are grieving for all those who are hurting and uh, those who have sicknesses and diseases and um, for those who have family issues and struggles, maybe those who are dealing with not being able to work or uh, have a job that's just so demanding. And um, we pray for those, Lord, who are struggling with their faith. And I pray that you will uh, help them to also be overcomers. Lord, I pray for um, the ones here today who can't talk about their problems, but uh, you know what they are. And Lord, I pray for the one here today who has the, the biggest problem of not having any problems at all. Um, be with all of us. Tend to our needs. And we'll pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. And we join together our voices and our hearts and we pray together the way Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's all stand.
be seated. We should cheer for the pastor every week. <laughs> today from Philippians chapter 3, and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation this morning. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Philippian believers, you going to come stand with me? You come stand with me, come on. Yeah, come on. No, I don't need that. I got one. Thank you. You need a pocket. All right, here we go. Watch out for the dogs. Those people who do evil. Thank you. There we go. Those people who do evil. Those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who truly are circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if ever there was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. So that, no, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. But I press on to, the, to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, my brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. In one of my churches um, years ago, there was a guy in the congregation who used to show dogs. He was a handler in dog shows. And I don't know whether you've ever been to one of those kind of events or maybe you've watched one on television. 
Uh, but quite honestly, it was a, when I watch them, it's a struggle for me to decide what in the world they're looking for as a better dog, one better dog. I mean, I like all dogs, right? Anna knows we get we 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 like dogs. Um, so I, one one's just as good as another, as far as I'm concerned. But I ask I asked this guy one time. I said, "What is it that the judges look for?" And he said, "There's three things: performance, presentation, and pedigree." Performance, presentation, and pet. He said, now performance, that's what the dog does. You know, that dog, they, the, the owners have spent time and money training that dog to do certain things, to act a certain way, to stand a certain way, to sit a certain way, to, to walk or to run with a certain gait, you know, and, and they've prepared that dog for those shows. And so that performance part of it is up to the dog. The presentation part, he said, is up to the handler, like himself. He said, you know, how I, how I move that dog, how I command that dog, how we get along, how we work together, that's the presentation part. But he said the most important thing is the pedigree. People who know dogs, and especially the judges, they know where that dog came from. They know its parents. They know its grandparents. They know the bloodlines. They know about those dogs. And the more they know about those dogs, the more they like them. So he said, if you want to be successful in the dog show world, you got to get a dog that the judges know where that dog came from. Pedigree is essential. <clears throat> Which brings me to the question, how in the world have we got to the point where we equate ourselves with dogs? Because in a lot of people's minds, I ask this question for this reason, uh, in a lot of people's minds, a lot of folks believe my pedigree is worth so much more <clears throat> than anything else. That my, you know, where I came from, who I came from, what, what my background is means so much that everybody should be impressed with who I am. And there's a lot of folks in a lot of churches who have that mentality. I'm a nice person. I'm a good guy. I'm a friend. I'm a good neighbor. I'm a, I'm a great coworker. I... I do all kinds of nice stuff for nice people and for some who's not so nice. You know, and as I've said before, I, you know, you can use my line if you want to. I, I don't smoke, drink, or chew or go out with girls that do. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a good guy. And that's the mentality of a lot of church folks. But, like I told the lady who was the organist at one of my churches, and I'm not picking on musicians because I am one, but she had an attitude. I was her pastor for four years, and all she ever did was complain. And I sat down with her one day in her living room, and she looked at me, and just as serious as she could be, demanding what she wanted because she said, I've been the organist in that church for 35 years. You remember? And somehow the Spirit of God got a hold of me and I said, so what? A lot of good people are going to stand before God someday. And they think their pedigree is going to get them into heaven. I, I was a good person. I lived on the west side. I went to Nauvoo Church. And God's going to look at him and say, so what? The Apostle Paul was addressing the same argument, the same problem, the same issue when he said, you know, he was talking to people who were like him. Apostle Paul was a Roman citizen. He was born into it. He didn't buy his way in. 
Then secondly, he was Jewish. Again, he was born into the Jewish bloodline. He had the background. He talks about it. He said, I had Jewish parents and I, I, I had a bris when I was eight days old and I, and I was trained in Jewish traditions and I was trained in Jewish school and I grew up Jewish. He even knew the language. That was important because back in those days, Jewish people had been scattered all over the world. And, and while they kept their customs and their religious practices, one thing they didn't keep, especially if they were scattered someplace else around the Roman Empire, was they didn't speak Hebrew. They picked up the language where they lived. And they didn't keep speaking Hebrew. Paul said, I speak the language. I mean... I'm Appalachian. I speak Appalachian. Some of y'all do too. If I were to say to you, if some guy came up to me and I was working on my car and that person said, what are you doing? And I answered and said, well, I'm fixing my car because I'm fixing to go to the store and buy all the fixings that we're going to be fixing for dinner Sunday. Some of you all understand what I just said. You're my people. And some of you all are looking at me like, what did he just say? You're not my people. (laughs) I'm praying for you. Apostle Paul spoke the language. And then he said, I was a Pharisee. I studied the law and I was, I, and a lot of scholars believe he studied under two of the greatest Hebrew scholars of his day. One of them was Gamaliel, who we read about in the book of Acts. He was intelligent. He knew the scriptures backwards, not forwards. They read the scriptures backwards in Hebrew. That's an inside joke. You can laugh. But Paul said, I've got the pedigree. I've got the background. I have the bloodlines. And yet, you know what Paul compared that to? (laughs) We went to the white gravel mines last night for the Cavern of Choices. Church and I and another couple. And, you know, before you go in, they tell you, you're going to be in here for about 45 minutes. And some of it is pretty frightening. We have porta johns right over there. You probably ought to use one before you go in. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to say the word out loud. We're in church. But Paul said, my righteousness, all my pedigree, everything that I was as a Hebrew is like the stuff that floats around in a port john That's what it is. Y'all, y'all been in a port john right? He said, the, the New Living Translation calls it garbage, but we know what we're talking about here. Paul said, my Hebrew background, my training, my status, my role as a Pharisee means nothing when I stand before God. It's a false sense of security, church, to think that you have accomplished anything, that you are somebody special. It's a false sense of security. It's a, this is homecoming season for a lot of schools, right? Yeah. And um, colleges, high schools are having homecoming celebration. And one of the things a lot of the schools do on uh, on the day before the big game is they have a big pep rally. And most of them have some kind of a large bonfire. Right? 
Now, at my school, we used to do that, and the way, and, and, and there's always the chance that something bad could happen. It could get out of hand. It's happened at a few colleges in recent past. We've read about it in the news. And so at my school, the way we handled that is we got a freshman. We pulled a freshman, picked one randomly, and handed them a fire extinguisher and said, if anything bad happens, you're in charge. That's a false sense of security. That's exactly what you think is important. What you think you've accomplished. What you think is impressive. What you think what you've done for God or in the name of the Lord It's a false sense of security because that means nothing when it comes to your faith. Nothing. What truly matters is that we are born again disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what matters. Paul said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. I want to know Jesus Christ so well that that which raised him up from the dead is alive and well in me. Church, I don't know about you, but we could stand to have a few more folks who are sold out to Jesus and have the power of resurrection working in them. The church needs to rise up in the power of the resurrection so that we can do amazing things in the name of Jesus Christ. And you know what else Paul said? Not only do I want to know him in the power of resurrection, I want to know him in his sufferings. Now, it's interesting to me. Jesus lived, suffered, died, and was resurrected. Paul said, I want to know the power of his resurrection so that I can suffer. Now, why did he say that? He knew, just like we know, life happens. And if we're living for Jesus and if we're striving to be the best kind of disciple that we can be, I guarantee you the devil knows about it. Satan is aware. He's been clued in. I don't believe ever that Satan gets a phone call and says, hey, oh, by the way, did you know so-and-so got saved? And Satan said, well, no, I didn't know that. Thanks for sharing. The minute we decide that we are going to get right with Jesus and we're going to live for him is the same moment that Satan says, blankety, blankety, blank. And he begins to come after us. So we're going to suffer. Paul said, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. Because when I do, then I can overcome the sufferings. I can deal with the struggles. I can handle the pain. I can get through this mess. And then he, he uses an illustration from, from the Olympic world. You know, Olympic games were big back then. It was a big deal. And of course, the the most famous event in the Olympics was the marathon. And whoever won the marathon every four years was treated as a god. I mean, they were heroes. And Paul borrows a phrase from the marathon world. Forgetting what lies behind, I press on to the call of the upward calling. Honestly, I don't understand marathon runners. I don't understand runners, period. I wouldn't run from here to the door if the building was on fire. I gave up running when I graduated high school. I mean, my theory when I played softball was if you hit it far enough, you don't have to run. But I have never watched 
a marathon where somebody's running a marathon and it's 26.2 miles. 26 plus miles comes out to 300 and some yards. 26 miles, 300 and some yards. Nobody, I've, ever, I've never seen this happen where somebody ran 25 miles and then stopped and turned around and went, wow, I did all that? Look, look what I just did. I ran from way down there to here. Isn't that something? No, they keep going because the race isn't over. They're not done. They have another mile point two left. And they press on. And Paul said, as disciples, as devoted disciples of Jesus Christ, we are to press on. And as the book of Hebrews says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and now is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Oh, my Lord and Savior is in the driver's seat. He's running the show. I want to tell you a story. I remember hearing this story. Dr. Maxie Dunham was a pastor in in Tennessee and for many, many years. And then he became the president of Asbury Theological Seminary. And I remember hearing him tell this story one time when he was when he was a young pastor, he was he was pastoring in a small town and had a church there and pretty active church. People were involved and stuff was going on. And he said there was a there was a class, a Sunday school class of third graders. He said there were nine of them. And they were faithful. They were there every Sunday. They loved coming to Sunday school because they had a teacher who cared. And I forget the guy's name. Who was he? We'll, we'll just say it was Henry. And he taught this class, and and there were there were there were nine kids, but one of the kids, one of the kids in the class, had Down syndrome. Now this was quite a few years ago, and we didn't understand the disease like we do now. We have better ways of dealing with it, and. And um, this kid, he, he was there, but he, he, he wasn't totally accepted by his classmates. You know, they kind of kept Philip. Philip was his name. They kind of kept Philip at a distance. He was in class every Sunday, but he sat at the end of the table by himself. All the other kids sat up at this end, and Philip sat down there by himself. And, then, and sometimes when Philip would try to answer a question, the other kids would giggle or snicker or, or make fun of him. But he came every week. And around Easter time, teacher Henry wanted the kids to learn about new life. Well, they want to have a lesson on new life. And so he... He asked some of the ladies of the congregation, I need your help. Some of you remember when pantyhose were sold in eggs. Can I say pantyhose in church? Can I do that? And they came in these big eggs, right? Came apart in the middle. He got some of the ladies to bring some of those eggs in. And, and he gave one to each child. He said, I want you to go outside and I want you to find something outside that represents new life. Put it inside your egg and bring it back in. We'll talk about it. So he turned the kids loose and out into the yard, out around the church they went, you know, and they're picking stuff up. So he gave them a few minutes and then he called them back in. <laughs> Maxie said, it was great. The kids were just... Fired up, they were excited. They come running in, carrying their eggs. And they came into the classroom and teacher said, who wants to go first? And one little child said, I want to go first. And opened up their egg and there was a flower. 
So this flower represents new life for me. And all the kids clapped. The second one opened up. His aunt's to God opened it up and a butterfly flew out. <laughs> and all the kids were like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Isn't it? The third kid sitting there, yeah, yeah, I got my eyes. Opens it up, rocks. And the teacher said, well, how do these rocks represent new life? Well, I knew them other kids was going to get flowers and stuff. I wanted something different. So these rocks are new life to me. Whatever. Well, they came to Philip. And Philip was excited and opened up his egg. Nothing inside. And all the kids started to snicker. Oh, man, he, he didn't even understand what we were supposed to do. And the teacher said, well, Philip, didn't you understand? Philip said, oh, yeah. He said, it's empty. That represents new life because the tomb was empty. And it got deathly silent. And it was at that moment that Philip was accepted by the other kids in the class as one of their own. And from that point on, Philip was always included in the group. He didn't sit by himself at the end of the table. He was a part of the class. And they, they all respected him and they, they wanted him to share and that kind of stuff. The unfortunate thing, Maxie said, was back then we didn't understand Down syndrome as much as we do now. And it was a few months later that Philip got some kind of disease or infection and his, his frail little body and his compromised system couldn't handle it. And he died. They had his funeral at the church. And when it came time for the, for the pass by at the end of the service, Eight little kids came forward and they laid an empty egg on the altar. New life. That's what it's about, church. That's what Paul's talking about. The old stuff is gone. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things, all things have become new. Don't for a minute more believe that just because you think you're somebody special, that that's going to mean anything when it comes to eternity. I don't care who you think you are. And I don't say that to be mean. I say that with all the love I can muster. Unless you know Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection, it means nothing. Let's pray. God, thank you for Paul's most appropriate message most significant, honest testimony. These were, these were people that he loved, people he'd led to the Lord, a church he'd established, a place where he'd been jailed for being a Christian, and yet you helped him to overcome that. And people came to know Christ. And Paul only wanted the best for them. And you want the best for us. I pray for anyone here today who thinks that who they are and what they've accomplished is, is, is most meaningful. I pray that you'll help them get that garbage out of their minds. Let us commit ourselves, Lord, to being faithful disciples and to know Jesus in the power of his resurrection. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Let's all stand up. What's our song, Donnie? Oh yeah, my faith looks up to thee.
I remind you that we're having lunch together as soon as we get done here. So I'm going to go ahead and say grace. And that way, when we get downstairs, you can just walk up along the hall, wall, get yourself a bowl, and have at it. There's all kinds of soup and sandwiches and stuff. So follow the directions of those down there, and we will, we will rejoice together, and we will feast together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time here today, and thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you every Sunday. I ask that you will bless us now as we go from this place and especially as we go downstairs and share a meal together. I pray, Father, that you will bless the food and the fellowship, that it might nourish our souls as well as nourish our bodies. Thank you for everyone who's provided this food for us. May it be to your glory. And as we go from this place, let us go in your strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, so just go down the ramp, wait on Brock to pick you up, and he'll take you around the back. All right, now go. Go ahead, Anna. Anna.